Hi everyone and welcome to the first Cocos podcast, a podcast about co-creation of educational content. Today is the first podcast and for this day's podcast I have Professor Dr. Engineer Ruben Verborg. Ruben, welcome. Hi Esther. I am Esther Loof. I am a postdoc in experimental psychology and I will be hosting this podcast series. So, um, I have been giving a interactive co-creation course for the last two years now. You have already been doing this for... One extra year, I guess. It's going to be my fourth year now. Yeah. Yes, so three years in the bank, uh, fourth year coming on. Can you uh, tell the viewers a bit who you are and how you rolled into this co-creative courses thing? So I'm Ruben, I'm a professor at Ghent University here in Belgium. Um, I specialize in, in the web, web technology. And I'm teaching a course on, on web development. And I basically started with co-creation right away from the moment I had to teach about the web. And you immediately wanted to do um, co-creation with this course? Or how did this idea evolve? So let me maybe explain a bit about um, how things happened, right? So th because th there's two dimensions that are important. Um, so there's the co-creation dimension of doing things together. And there's the openness uh, dimension of putting the things that you create um, in certain degrees of being public or not. And they're orthogonal, so you can choose them independently. And actually how my ID started first what was with the, um, the openness, basically, because I realized that I was going to uh, be teaching a course. I had to make all the materials myself. And I thought, like, wouldn't it be such a waste if all the work that I put in would just be seen by, by the group of, of students that I'm teaching every year. So from there, the idea of, of just making it, it public started as a way of the visibility. And then immediately with the visibility also came, came the feedback. And importantly, it's not the feedback of experts that's important. It's also the feedback of people learning this stuff. Because even though everything might be correct, if it's not helpful for learning, it's not a good thing either. So from my efforts being in the open, and then also having open feedback. And then, instead of just it being feedback, actually having people write things, like having people make suggestions and come up with, with their own um, ideas, that was, um, yeah, that was, was a very short cycle. Like, it, it suddenly clicked, this is what I have to do. And I feel much more comfortable this way, because there's going to be bugs in, in my course, but now people can see them and, and fix them. People can discuss about the material, that they, they can disagree, and then it's not just my responsibility anymore. Like Learning things becomes a responsibility of all of us, basically. So it's about accountability and responsibility, both for you, but also for the students, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and that's also nice for them because their efforts also pay off. Like if they fix something, it is going to be seen, other people are going to use it, so they help others learn. And what they also sometimes don't realize is that it helps themselves learn. Like seeing something, analyzing it, and turning your feedback into an action, into a concrete change, um, helps your own learning process tremendously. So it's it's a win-win for, for everyone. Like um, honestly, I still have to think about the major disadvantages. Uh, I, I think, I think this is the way that, that works best for all those involved. Mm -hmm. uh, do you say this explicitly to your students? You are going to benefit from the approach that we are taking, this co-creation approach? Not that much, actually. Um, I think intrinsic motivation is the most beautiful motivation there is. So my primary goal is to um, get them enthusiastic about making edits, about, about contributing basically so right now i'm not emphasizing the process too much like hey by doing this because um, i probably should consider this but by playing on this intrinsic motivation like you're doing something that benefits all of us um i think that's already a good start and the fact that it helps their learning process is a nice side effect so to speak but maybe they'll even get it themselves. Like, hey, actually, yeah, th this ha has been helpful. So I kind of hope that hmm, I have a more organic approach. Like, I just let, let things grow. Um, and then the end, they'll realize, hey, this was helpful or, or not. Um, it might be an approach to um, indeed say it more explicitly upfront. Like, if you're going to do this, then that is going to happen. But 
But I don't want, want them to do it for the effect. I want them to do it for because they want to. Because then they're actually learning without realizing that, 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 that they're learning. And, and isn't that the most beautiful form of learning, right? Yes, that's true. It's completely different from the approach that we are taking. Our course takes an entire year and they have four tests during the year. So they already have some sense of how well they are doing during the year. And then, of course, you have this feedback moment during the year and there we, we tell them, look, you don't have very good grades now, but we also don't see you asking questions. And all the other people who have good grades, well, they asked a lot of questions. So it really it gives us a moment, this feedback moment, to really talk about the process of learning and how their own initiative will help them. But this, this of course, a completely different approach than your course, because in your course, there's only the end exam. There are no uh, tests in, in between. Right? Which is problematic and, and quite ridiculous, and yeah. <laughs> frankly. I mean, continuous evaluation, I mean, just knowing how well you're doing, indeed, as a good motivator is also much more useful. Um, and in fact, I, ha I hadn't thought about too much about how evaluation indeed changes the process of learning. Because indeed, what probably happens is that I'm, I'm teaching the course and then maybe some people during the class get ideas to change something and by the time they're home, maybe one of them will do it. Whereas, and, and then of course, at, at the end of, of the semester, there's the exam and then they all study, then they see the material, but then, they don't maybe feel like changing things anymore. Um, they don't want to complicate things too much. So by just forcing them to be in touch with the material earlier, indeed they might be more inclined to, um, to make changes. Also, not unrelated is the whole flipped classroom idea, where they actually spend more time with the material themselves before coming to class. That would also be an incentive because then but then we'll then they will get the frustrations um, earlier on, because actually, when I'm teaching a course, so like my co-creation material are slides, and I'm teaching with the slides, and I think a lot of the gaps in the slides are masked by my explanation, and maybe also some gaps in my explanation are masked by the slides. So they see it as a whole. It's probably only when you see the material in isolation that you really think there's something missing there, or this is wrong, this is, this is confusing. And because they cannot edit what I'm saying, obviously, um, but, but they can edit the slides, the, the material. So maybe you need, by finding ways to get them to engage earlier with the material, they might be more inclined to give feedback, especially if they see the result of their own feedback on, on things. But coming back to your question about the process, um, I honestly don't know. It also depends, like my students are um, undergrads, are yours graduate students or? Um, undergrads. Undergrads too. So I think we also have slightly different audiences and interests. Like I think in a more psychology setting, you have people who are naturally thinking more about people and their processes. Um, I don't think it's something that, my, that most of my students are consciously doing when, when mm -hmm. they're following a class. Um, but I don't know. I, I guess both approaches, like so being explicit about the process or just focusing on, on the motivation aspects and not being too formal about the process, I think they both have their merits and they can be used in conjunction. Like It's not because you explain a process that you don't have to work on the intrinsic motivation. It's not because you have you try to instill a vibe, they don't have to explain the process and the benefits. So maybe just doing both will, will get us uh, yeah. further. I should try that. By the way, the, um, the funny side effect that it has is that students often just pick up the things that you explicitly tell them. So for example, then in the, in the, the following years, from some of these students that I then see taking other courses, they just repeat, ha, huh, we will get further if we help each other. <laughs> so it's like, once you make the message explicit, they just also repeat it which is maybe not a bad this thing. This is a good point, yeah. Indeed, because you know, it, it's, it's a spark that you're giving, right? It's a spark and they use it to create more sparks and a big fire. And you make it very concrete, uh, instead of just having a feeling like of, oh, this works, but I cannot really pinpoint what mm. makes this work. Yes, okay, good point, you've convinced me. I should talk about the process. Thanks, Esther. Yes, uh, talking about process. Can you tell us a bit more about the technological basis that you see for co-creation? Well, um, first of all, there's multiple layers, of course. 
let's say simply said if you're working um let's say on 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 PowerPoint, for instance, right? And you say, well, I'm gonna put this figure there and this text there and so on and so forth. However, collaborating in such an environment can, can be difficult because um, if multiple edits happen, suppose that one person adds a word somewhere and then the other person is, is moving something, like how do you combine all of these things? And the end result is often something you might have seen if you use Word with multiple people. You get lots of suggested changes, and this works fine if it is one document and one person giving feedback. The moment that multiple people are giving feedback and there's multiple versions that you need to coordinate over email and whatnot, it gets very, very difficult to manage. So managing collaboration in a very graphical environment has challenges and doesn't scale too well with many people. So what we do is we don't work in a graphical way, we work on, on the text that's underneath the slides, underneath the, the course material. So instead of being very specific about where things are on the slide or on a page, we're more specific about what their role and purpose is and we leave it more to the computer to then determine the layout in the end. And this has a drawback, namely you're not fully in control of exactly what the end result looks like. However, you are much more in control of the content. So if people make changes, those changes focus more on content than on the end result. And this means that it's easier to combine inputs from, from many different sources. So basically on, on software, which is just long text files, we have a tradition of collaborating with sometimes hundreds or thousands of, of people on, on a handful of files, and that works, that scales. And if we apply the same thing on, on courses, so also see them as kind of a software project, basically, instead of seeing them, them, them as something graphical, then we can collaborate more easily. Yeah, so this is something that works perfectly for you, but will not scale automatically to someone who is giving medieval poetry courses. Well, actually, I think for medieval poetry it would be very interesting because what is medieval poetry more than a text with annotations, right? That's true. Um, so having lots of annotations from different sources, being able to version these might, might be very useful. But if we don't want people to be IT experts, and we don't want that, uh, we need to find an easy way of, of graphically exposing this to them, like, hey, Technically, it works with this very complex version control software that the ideas are using, but here's a very easy graphical way of, of achieving the, the same things. And such solutions are, are being built. Um, like I see those ideas happen. Um, at some, how shall I say, you get more power if you're an IT user because you know how it works deep down. But even for us, it would be easier if you could just click a button. Despite knowing how it works on the inside, if we can make it easy, just a graphical user interface that happens. And actually, for software, we see this evolution where 10 years ago, you really need to do everything by hand. Right now, you see many software projects where people have a choice. Like you, you can use a low level, you can use a high level um, GitHub web interface uh, as well. So by having a choice and by always being able to switch between different choices whenever you want, we can give people the best of both worlds, I would say. Which brings me to the next question. Um, we now talked about the technical implementation of how to do co-creation, but another important technical aspect is that your course lives on the web. Like you often tell me, uh, that sometimes we are using our current PowerPoint slides, just the way that we used to use an overhead and that we're not yet fully realizing what extra capabilities the web gives us. And we're not harvesting any of that for our courses. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that was actually an important um, third driver for my course when I started. Because as so I told you about the open aspect, about the co-creation, but using the web was also one of them because I realized that to tell my story, I needed um, multimedia. And also it just is the wrong philosophy. Like creating such a big PowerPoint has the misconception or illusion that you can bundle up the world in, in, into one file. Whereas putting on a web makes it part of a whole. Like it is out there with other websites, it connects to, I mean, it's just a part of the web. So it's, it's not just an isolated thing. And this makes my slides by themselves also very light and, and tiny because 
there's nothing on there but the text, the videos, they come from YouTube, the tweets, they come from Twitter and so on. So I'm just linking to material on the rest of the web and including it in my, my slides. So that's very important for the kind of interactions that you have. And also what is very crucial is we've seen at the university that over the past 10 years, a lot of the discussion that used to happen within our platforms has now moved to Facebook. Like students discuss material on, on Facebook. Um, and there's a couple of things to be said about that. Um, first of all, it's good that they're discussing. We should emphasize that. I want them to discuss. That's important. Um, it's also good that they have a safe space and we don't always need to be there. However, um, sometimes misunderstandings and misconceptions can propagate and we can't help them because we're not allowed in these groups, which is fine, which is their own right. But I think they're narrowing down the, the, um, the experience a bit. But now the, tr the trouble is, like, if you... So Facebook has this very siloed approach where discussion happens there. Now, if we use PowerPoint uh, files, we have another silo. Like, we have those separate silos. And how do you connect them? If they're connecting on Facebook, how, do, how can they dis discuss a, a slide? They can't point to the slides. Right? They have to say, well, open this file. And I mean, not the latest version, but actually the version before. Go to this specific <laughs> slide and tap and treat animation. Then you'll see what I mean. I mean, no. No one will do that. Whereas... By putting things on the web, every single slide, in my case, gets its own URL. This means that if people want to discuss it, well, they can just link to it. Um, even though I can see what they're discussing, at least I'm facilitating discussion. So what I'm doing by putting things on the web is bringing the students closer to the material. I'm bringing the material to whatever it is that they want to use, and, and they use it as they wish. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you use a lot of hyperlinks in your slides. And I also do that in our course. Like we don't use real uh, slides. We use Google Docs and we put all of the content material on the Google Docs. But in these Google Docs, every time that we are discussing a certain um, a certain words that I don't want to explain in detail, I, I just place a uh, hyperlink. But then it starts to become a little bit fuzzy where the course ends and what the material for the exam really is. Do you also have this concern for your but, students? But, but they're two different things, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Because yes, it gets fuzzy, but guess what? It is fuzzy. Knowledge does not have a box around it. So knowledge doesn't stop. Knowledge is also not a line. It's not a sequential things of here's what you need to know. It, it is a web. It is a graph of, of things that are interconnected. So the whole thing that we can just linearize knowledge and put it in slides and just store it somewhere with a box around it, that is nonsense. So the fact that it gets fuzzy is because it is fuzzy. Um, and that's also what I mean by putting things on the web. It becomes part of a bigger whole. Like knowledge does not stop at my slide. This is only the beginning, in fact. It's just an entry point into the endless web. Um, this is great for learning, because if you're curious, you can just keep on learning. But then I need people ask like, do we have to know that? And I'm always inclined to say, yes, of course, you have to know that. This is very important. But will I ask about it on the examination? No, I won't, if that's your question. So, uh. yeah. I guess what we are trying to do is give the very good students this extra challenge to really get them going, to teach them that it is their responsibility in a way to pull the others the other ones up and i think that this really helps for the section that is really in the in the middle but i do think that co-creation is not really something that will help the the laggers catch up to the group i think it will it it has the you know it can have the pitfall of opening that gap even more well, i think it's it all depends on how we see co-creation we shouldn't be too narrow about it in the sense that it's not just who has written a certain word in, in a certain course. Um, we also need to look at like all signals they give are input to the course and are in a sense co-creation. So if they just say something like, hey, this part is confusing to me, that's very valuable input to make it better. So if we also include annotations, voices, reactions, those things as part of a co-creation process, and we should, then they will be able to express it, which also helps them like, hey, I'm not alone. Other people are expressing the, the same thing. We can notice it and we can do something about it. So I guess the answer to that is 
be really broad in what co-creation means. It's not just the people who write words in the course. It's anyone who gives any type of feedback or signal to the course that eventually will, will propagate in, in better course material.